This is July 19, 1999, and this is part of the Morse Institute Library Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. We're in Natick, Massachusetts, and may I ask what your name is, please? I'm Carl Johansson. And would you spell your last name, please? J-O-H-A-N-S-O-N. Thank you. What is your age, Carl? I'm 76. And your address? In Natick. And uh, current mar marital status? I'm married. <laughs> Children? Five. And grandchildren? Twelve. Twelve grandchildren? Mm -hmm. You're doing very well. <laughs> Can you tell me where you were born, Carl? I was born in New York City. New York City. And raised there, or where? No, I was raised uh, most, mostly in the New England area. Mm -hmm. how, how did you come to come to uh, Natick, Massachusetts? Uh, <clears throat> I had a transfer in the job that I was in, and I wound up in the Boston area, and I, I found Natick. Mm -hmm. About what, what year was that? That was 1953. 53, so you came to Natick after the war. Right. Okay. And what was your family background? Can you tell us about your parents? Yeah, my, my, my parents uh, were in the Salvation Army. Dad was a, uh, a uh, Salvation Army officer. And uh, uh, as a result of being in that position, he was moved around quite a bit between uh, various places like Providence, uh, <clears throat> Boston, Jamestown, New York, and that's how I grew up. I graduated from high school in Brooklyn. In I Brooklyn, lived. New York? Yes. But in a sense, you were an army brat, if, if the expression pertains. Yes, I've been uh, called Following that. your dad's occupation mm -hmm. around. Now then, you joined the military. Uh, can you tell us where you joined the military? Well, at the time, we were living in Jamestown, New York, and uh, I... Uh, got on the train in Buffalo. And from Buffalo, that is where I went to my first place in the Army, which was Atlantic City, New Jersey. Okay, and what year was that? That was uh, in 1943. Why did you join the military in 1943? I wanted to fly. And I was interested in the aviation cadet program. So you joined, you, that led automatically to joining the Air Corps, was that it? Yes, I, I applied for it and uh, I was accepted. Did friends or members of your family join at the same time? Uh, not at the same time. I have a brother who uh, joined just about three months before I did. Mm -hmm. But when you got on that train, you were you were alone. Yes, I, I was all by myself. And you signed up, and uh, they sent you to your basic training or something like yes, that. Yes, basic training, and that was in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Atlantic City. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you tell us a little bit about that? What did you do? As were you an air cadet? Is that what you said? Well, <clears throat> uh, the Army Air Corps naturally was part of the Army, so I went to regular Army basic training, and. Uh, it was the same type of basic training that anyone who joined the Army would have experienced. Uh, I was close order drill, uh, marches, physical training, and uh, that seemed to be the, the basics of it, which was close order drill and mm -hmm. uh, learning to be a soldier. Did you, um, at Atlantic City, did you develop close friendships or uh, meet with people that you might see later on during the war? Uh, yes. Uh, a group of us were sent from Atlantic City to Burlington, Vermont, where we went to a, uh, uh, cadet uh, pre-flight training program at the University of Vermont. And uh, there were several guys that I was in basic training with that uh, I went to Burlington with. When your basic training was finished at Atlantic City, uh, were all of you sent up to Vermont or just 
those of you who are in this cadet program? <clears throat> no, uh, a lot, well, all of us were in the cadet program and uh, we were broken up into various groups and, and some groups went to other colleges and our group, the group I was in, went to University of Vermont. Okay, can you tell us about arriving at the university? What happened to you there? Well, it was uh, very much like attending college. We lived in a dormitory and uh, we went to classes. We also had a limited amount of military training, close order drill, and physical training. It was quite a bit of physical training. And uh, part of the program was an introduction to flight where we uh, were taken up in Piper Cubs and were given the opportunity to handle the controls. But the, the real training didn't start until later. At Burlington, what did you like the most about it or what did you dislike about it? Well, it was winter time and it was cold. You were at Lake, on Lake Champlain, right? Yes, indeed. <laughs> yes. At any point during that phase of your training or future training, uh, did the military prepare you for the cultural differences you might face somewhere they figured you might go to India or Saipan or something like that? Was that part of any of your training? I don't recall any uh, training of that nature. Uh, the training that we got was, was strictly military and uh, as far as being trained to adapt to other cultures, I don't recall any, mm -hmm. anything of that nature. And at Burlington, um, you went up in Piper Cubs. What else did you have to do relative to flying there? Well, there was uh, ground school where they uh, taught us some of the basics of, uh, of flight, of, uh, of uh, navigation, and uh, flight rules. At what point, um, at what point in your career are they beginning to point you to a specific type of duty, for example, fighter pilot, bomber pilot, navigator? Um, did it start there at Burlington or later on? No, it started at the, at the next station, which was uh, Nashville, Tennessee. That was a, what they call the classification center. And there we took all kinds of tests to determine what uh, type of uh, activity we would be best suited for. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us something about those tests? What do they consist of to point you to uh, your future aircraft? Well, they, uh, the, the test didn't point us to a specific aircraft. What the test did was to determine whether you would be suitable for being, a, say, a pilot or a bombardier or a navigator. And, and based on, uh, on, on many of the t tests that they gave you, I can't remember all the t kinds of tests we got, but uh, there were tests uh, on mathematics, uh, and uh, then there were other physical tests, there, physical coordination, and uh, things of that nature. It was rather thoroughgoing, and this gave us uh, a pretty go well going over so that they could determine which uh, task we would be best suited for. Mm -hmm. I guess I, I'm going to jump back all the way almost to the beginning. Uh, because it's, it's not on this sheet to ask you, but what was your uh, education before you joined the military to prepare you for these tests and, and what you accomplished? Okay, I, I had uh, started at uh, Brown University and I was there a year before I went into the service. Mm -hmm. and I was taking uh, an engineering course. I was interested in uh, civil engineering. Were you sent to Tennessee as an individual or part of a unit? As a group. There's a group that we left Burlington 
the Burlington group all went as, uh, right. we, as a class? As a okay. group, we went to the classification center. Okay. And then where did you go from there? Okay, uh, at, <clears throat> at the classification center, I, uh, I got my heart's desire and I was told I would be in pilot training. So I uh, was sent to Avon Park, Florida. And there's where I uh, attended primary flight school. But some of the I others, have, excuse me, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I have to back up a little bit there. That was not the first uh, place I went. The first place I went to was Maxwell Field, Alabama. This was uh, pre-flight school. And there it was uh, uh, <clears throat> quite a bit of military training as well as uh, academics, math, physics, navigation, courses of that nature. And from there, I went to Avon Park, and there's where I began uh, primary flight training. And at uh, Avon Park, we, we flew the this, this Stearman trainer, mm -hmm. it's a bi-wing airplane, and uh, nowadays we see a few of them uh, from time to time. They're crop dusters all over the United States, aren't they? I guess, I guess they were. There aren't many, too many left because many years have passed since then. Can you put a date on uh, arriving in Florida? I would put that at about uh, April or May of 40, no, it couldn't have been 44. It was quite a bit earlier than that. Okay. Um, did your duties change any time after that? Once you were a pilot, you were a pilot. <clears throat> well, the, the, uh, the pilot training, uh, uh, consisted of primary flight school and then basic training, which was a slightly more advanced type airplane, and then finally uh, advanced training. And uh, in advanced training I trained in, uh, in a twin engine airplane and uh, that dusted me for flying multi-engine multi airplanes. Mm -hmm. And I graduated from uh, uh, flight school and got my wings in uh, May of 1944, class of 44E. And that was in uh, Columbus, Mississippi. What happened to you then? This is after D-Day or just before? Oh, no. This was 1944. D-Day was in 1945. So uh, from there, I went to uh, Dodge City, Kansas. And there is where I got the uh, indoctrination and training on the B-26 airplane. At Dodge City? Right. <laughs> the, right next that to Boot Hill. A, <laughs> That's right. It has a ring of the old... The sheriffs around there. Yeah. Um, I want to be very careful tracking you here. You're in Dodge City, Kansas, and have you met up with B-26 bombers? That was my first experience okay. with the B-26, yes. And can you tell us a little bit about the B-26 bomber? It's a very special plane. Yes, it's a, it's a twin-engine airplane. It uh, carries a crew of six, a uh, pilot, a co-pilot, a bombardier navigator, a radio operator, combination waste gunner, a top turret gunner who is also an armorer, and a tail gunner who is also the crew chief. And. Uh, it had uh, two R2800 engines, 
four-bladed propellers, and uh, tricycle landing gear. And it was considered a hot airplane at the time. It has previously been described in this room as the flying whore from Baltimore with no visible means of support. Would you say that was accurate? Uh, well, uh, that name and uh, quite a few others were there. It was also called the Widowmaker. And, uh, but even though it was a, a hot airplane and many people had problems learning to fly it, I found it to be a very good airplane, and it certainly was a good combat aircraft. Okay, and um, can you date now Dodge City? I'm trying to correlate this as to what else was happening in Europe. Okay, uh, well, uh, I graduated in May of 1944, mm -hmm. and from there I went to Dodge City, so it would have been uh, June. June of 44. Right. And how long were you at Dodge City? Uh, I would estimate perhaps two or three months. That brings moment. you up to the fall of 44? Right. And then what happened to and you? And from there I went to uh, Shreveport, Louisiana, Barksdale Field. And there's where I met my crew. And there's where we did training together as a crew, learning uh, formation flying and doing daytime and nighttime navigation flights. Was it the uh, practice at that time that when you got a crew, uh, you were married for the duration of the war? You stayed together as a group? Well, it happened that way with us. We stayed as a group all the way to our overseas combat experiences. Okay. Where did you go from there? Well, from Louisiana? <clears throat> yes, from yeah. Shreveport, Louisiana. Uh, uh, went to uh, Savannah, Georgia, and this was part of the uh, being sent overseas, and, and that was to equip us with equipment and so forth. We did not take a plane with us overseas. We were, we were a replacement crew. So <clears throat> we uh, were in Savannah for a while and then uh, New York. And from New York we got on to Mauritania and uh, across the Atlantic and landed in Southampton, Southampton, England. Wound up in a large replacement depot there. And from there, we were sent to Dijon, France. And that was going to be our base from which we would fly our missions. Were you at Dijon for the, uh, the, the remainder of the war? Yes. Okay, and how did you get there? Did you fly over or did you uh, cross the channel and uh, go in by truck or how did you get to your base? Well, we were flown uh, from, uh, from England to Paris and in, from Paris we got on a train which took us to Dijon. Now can you put a date on that? You're at your base where you're going to Go yes, into combat. Uh, okay, that was uh, in the latter part of January 1945. What was it like arriving there? All your training, everything you wanted to be was coming to a, a sharp focus. You and your crew, and you had a plane now, or did you get a different plane every time you went up? We uh, usually flew the same airplane uh, most of the time. Sometimes if it was uh, in maintenance or in for a major overhaul, you would fly another airplane. And uh, most of the time, the crew I, I came with, we, we stayed together. There were times when there were other missions, other crews that were short on personnel, they would 
borrow my gunners and they would fly with, with other crews in those missions. But uh, most of the missions we were together. Carl, can you tell us what the ground rules were? When you got there, uh, did they tell you that if you fly 35 combat missions, you go home, or was it you're just gonna stay here and fly till the war is over? Do you have any kind of an understanding of uh, how often you would go up? Yes, it was, uh, it was 60 missions. That, that, would, that, that would be the completion of your tour, and you would be entitled to go home. Can you tell us about your first combat mission? Well, the first combat mission I went on was as a co-pilot. No new replacement pilots started right off as, as a uh, first pilot. And uh, it was a routine mission, a bombing mission. And uh, it wasn't, uh, it was really a milk run, as they call them. And uh, <clears throat> no uh, enemy activity that I could see. And most of the missions were uh, missions where we would be bombing either a uh, railroad yard, an ammunition dump, or in some cases a barracks area. You're heading into the spring of um, 1945. Right. So that the land armies were um, pushing the Germans very heavily back toward Berlin in the final battles of the war. What kind of support were you giving them? Well, we were supporting the Ninth Army, and, uh, and that involved going after ammunition dumps, uh, troop concentrations, and uh, bridges. What kind of opposition did you have? Uh, on the main, uh, most of the uh, opposition was uh, any aircraft fire. And uh, at times uh, it got rather intense. And uh, those were the times when uh, it uh, got a little bit uh, dicey, as I could, would put it, because uh, when you're flying formation, your eyes are glued on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the lead plane. And uh, you can't take your eyes off it because you're flying very close. And with uh, the flak puffing up all around you, it was difficult to uh, keep that concentration. And then, of course, you would hear the guys on the intercom uh, commenting on uh, various things that would happen, and uh, uh, they would be commenting on, on the flak concentration. And the big temptation was to to take your eyes away from what you were doing to, to see what was happening. So, because we were flying formation, and that required intense concentration, I really did not see much of what was going on around me. How many planes were in your formation generally? Well, <clears throat> uh, most formations were made up of three flights, and there were there would be four four airplanes in um, in a flight, so that uh, you would have a lead ship, a number two man, a number three man, and a number four man, and many times you would also have a number five and a number six man. So you would have six man flights, three of them or 18 ships in a, in, a, in a formation. Was this the type of bombing uh, where the lead plane bombed and you all toggled on that signal? Correct, that is, that is how it was done. <clears throat> Did you have, it would, was your plane fast enough, and uh, did you operate in such a, f f a way that uh, you, you did not require uh, fighter planes to escort you? 
that no, that was not the case. Uh, we we did have a fighter escort, and uh, there were times when we felt that uh, we could have used more fighter escort. Can you tell us about one of those times? Well, uh, I can tell you about my last mission, which was the 23rd mission that I had flown. Uh, we were on a, a mission to uh, Germany, and the mission was to uh, bomb an airfield at uh, Lechfield. And uh, that's a uh, town which is uh, just a little bit east of Munich. And the weather was uh, questionable and we weren't sure that we would complete this mission. And as it turned out, we had decided to uh, abort the mission and head back to France. And this was when we were attacked by German jet fighters. We didn't know about them, and uh, this was the first we had seen of them. This is the ME-262? This is the Messerschmitt 262. And as a matter of fact, the airfield that we were hitting was a uh, airfield for a factory where these ME-262s were being produced and test flown. And our, our mission was to <clears throat> destroy as many of those airplanes as we could. But uh, some of them did get into the air and they came after us. In my flight, uh, we lost two airplanes that were shot down, and my plane lost an engine, and I had to feather that engine and fly back to, towards France on one engine. And that, of course, slowed me down. I wasn't able to keep up with the formation. But uh, one of my uh, other pilots, pulled out of formation and escorted me until we crossed the, the border into France. Being on one engine and losing altitude, we had to lighten the ship. We still had our, our bombs aboard, so we salvoed the bombs in safe so that they wouldn't explode on, on, on landing the ground. And we started throwing out uh, guns and anything that was heavy so that we were able to maintain altitude. We found, we went to a fighter strip in Lunville, France, which is not too far from Metz. And there is where I decided to land. I came in on an approach. Everything looked fine until the co-pilot said, hey, the gear is only halfway down. And we were at that point where we could not pull up and go around. It wouldn't do it on one engine. We had no choice but to raise the gear and belly land. And we did. We slid quite a ways. And we were very fortunate. We all walked away from it. But that was my last mission and my first encounter with jet airplanes. Can you, after all these years, Carl, tell us what you were thinking as you made that approach? One engine gone, landing gear not down. What were you thinking? Well, my thinking was <clears throat> simply that I've got to get this thing on the ground and uh, we're going to have to be able to walk away from it. And uh, back in the States, we had practiced ditching procedure where on ditching the airplane in water, we would have the, the crewmen take uh, positions in the radio compartment, sitting in tandem, one, one in front of the other. And of course, the rest of us were, were strapped in with our seat belts and harnesses. And uh, when I, I saw that we had to belly land, I hollered to the crew to prepare for crash landing. And they automatically took the ditching positions. 
and uh, <clears throat> the the deceleration on landing was was considerable. Uh, <clears throat> my headsets just flew off and landed landed up against the w windshield, and uh, it seemed like that thing slid for a long, long time. Actually, probably it didn't slide that long, but to me it was an eternity. And when it finally stopped, I opened up my hatch, and co-pilot and I jumped out. I was running to the end of the wing to jump off because I figured if this thing is gonna blow up, we better get out of here. I got halfway down the wing and turned around. I didn't see anybody. So I ran back and the hatch to, to the radio room was open. I looked down there <clears throat> and the guys were sitting down there passing the time of day just talking. I said, hey, you guys get out of here. And we, they finally got out of there, but fortunately no fire started. But uh, it was kind of scary at the time there. I thought, good Lord, I think the first thing they would want to do would be to get out of that airplane. But uh, we're very thankful we walked away from it. Can you go back just a minute in this? Um, had you guys heard about the, uh, the jets prior to that day? Did you know that's what we, your, your target was? Yes, we, knew, uh, we, uh, we were told that at briefing. And um, the day before, they had gone after the same target and had been attacked by jets and lost a few airplanes. So we knew we knew that uh, we could expect a little bit of this. And of course, having never seen it before, it was really something. Again, uh, my tail gunner was the first one to spot them coming at us. And uh, he was chattering on the intercom, giving the position to the rest of the crew of the, uh, where these fighters were coming from. And uh, he was an excitable guy. And he had to hold both buttons down at the same time, the mic button and the gun button. And all I could hear was the guns going off. I couldn't hear him. So that was one of the experiences there that I'll never forget. In this day and age, we, we accept jets, you know, all fighters are jets, but in those days, uh, what was your feeling being attacked by one of the first jet aircraft to operate in the war? <clears throat> well, at that time, my feeling was one of, uh, I just didn't know what was going on. And uh, this was all new to me, and it was scary because they were so fast and so agile that the <clears throat> we really didn't have much defense against them and they were very successful. Uh, they were producing these planes at a pretty good pace at that time and many of them were going up and the German Air Force realized that this was their only hope would be to knock down the bombers. They didn't want to engage the fighter aircraft because that would not be productive. They had to get the bombers out of the air because the bombers were winning the war. So you were carrying uh, twin fifties in the tail. Yes, uh, the tail. The tail position had uh, twin fifties, and and the top turret had. Twin, twin 50s and uh, two waste guns of single single 50 caliber machine guns. Do you know what armament the uh, German jet carried? <clears throat> well, uh, I've learned this since that uh, some of them had uh, 30 millimeter cannons and some had 40 millimeter cannons. Plus they also had uh, a cluster of 24 rockets that we had never seen before, we had experienced before in combat. And uh, they could fly out of formation and salvo a complete uh, set of 24 rockets and, and 
do quite a bit of damage. The date of that event was April of uh, April 26, 1945. That is right. And the war ended approximately three or four weeks later, didn't it? On May 8th. In Europe, that is, in yeah. Europe. Yeah, VE Day was 12 days later. So you were shot down uh, within 12 days of the end of the war in Europe. Exactly, yeah. But fortunately, that was also your last flight, is I think you said a moment ago. Well, it was my last mission. Last mission. Yeah. What unit were you in at, when this happened? <clears throat> I was in the 37th Squadron, uh, which was uh, part of the 17th Bomb Group. And uh, that was part of the 1st Tactical Air Force. And were your targets largely in Germany or uh, northern Italy, or where, the, where, where, where were you headed most of the time? Uh, mo most, most of the targets were in Germany, in, in southern, southern Germany. Um. When you were up there, going through all these experiences, did you feel that you were well trained, well clothed, uh, that you had been properly prepared? for what you were going through? I never th thought about it, but uh, since you've asked me, I, I would say I'm, I feel we were very well trained and adequately equipped. It couldn't have been any better as far as I can see. Did you feel the, that the officers with whom you flew, that is the leaders of your units, uh, gave you good leadership? Absolutely. There was, there was a, a great sense of comradeship amongst the flight crews, and that included the flight leaders. I know it's, it's difficult to uh, make a summary like this, but can you tell us what your greatest challenges were while you were in combat? Well, I alluded to that earlier when I talked about formation flying. Uh, the big challenge was to stay stay in position and to keep the keep the airplane where it was supposed to be, because just a momentary distraction would find yourself out all by yourself. When, uh, especially in occasions when uh, the lead ship would uh, take evasive action and flak was coming up. I remember one time I, I was distracted and when I turned around and looked, no, I didn't see anybody and the formation had just peeled off and, and to the left and I was going straight ahead. So I had to put it in a dive and get after him and get back in position again. <laughs> I assume you found them. <laughs> I found them, absolutely. Were you ever wounded in combat, Carl? No, fortunately I was not wounded. Were any of your crew? No. No, we were all very fortunate. Came back in one piece. Who were your closest friends in the service? Well, my closest friends were my, my co-pilot and my uh, bombardier. Uh, we did a lot of things together when we had time off and we got to know each other pretty well. Are you in touch with them today? Well. Uh, not today, because uh, they've both passed on. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, of the six of us, there are only two of us left. That's the top turret gunner, Chet Timmy, and myself. In a larger view of the, the, uh, the outfit or the unit you were in, um, are there reunions? Do you gather and talk about what <clears throat> yes they they have reunions and I've, I've been to a few of them and I went to one in uh, Sacramento California and then last year I went to one in Buffalo and of course uh, a lot of it's just reminiscing and uh, uh, talking about things that happened and showing pictures and meeting up with guys that you haven't seen for a while it's, it's always a good a good experience did you ever go back to France or Germany? No, I, I never have. Maybe someday I'll be I'll, I'll I'll do that. I sure would like to. 
while you were involved in all of this overseas, um, what did you hear and how did you hear about what was going on in other areas, the news of the war in general? Well, uh, there was the Stars and Stripes and, of course, Axis Sally and uh, that's mainly how, how we, we uh, kept up with what was happening. Were you ever given R&R uh, &R in some rear area during the time you were uh, in combat? Uh, well, as, as, as you know from uh, putting the dates together there, I was only in combat a few months before the war ended. But after the war ended, uh, our crew went on a uh, rest leave to Switzerland, and we had a nice time in Switzerland. Did anything like a USO show ever come to your base, or any civilian activity such as Hollywood starlets come in? No, I never, no. I never, never saw, saw anything like that. How much did you really know about the enemy you faced? Did you feel intelligence reports were uh, prepared you well for what you uh, would go into against the next day? Yes, of course. The uh, the briefings that we got prior to the mission were were very good, and uh, the the information that was given to us at that time naturally was was supported by the best intelligence that they had. I uh, I always felt good about uh, them passing on to us what we what we could expect and what to do. What was your opinion of uh, the Germans that you knew that you were going to meet in battle? They were very, very good. Their pilots were real good. And I've got to say that <clears throat> had the war lasted longer <clears throat> and had they been able to produce more of those ME-262, the outcome I'm afraid it would have been a lot different. Were there any times when your organization, your unit, uh, flew with members of other nations, any of the allies, the British or the French? Well, <clears throat> the French had a, a, a B-26 group, but uh, and they flew out of an, another airport Air, air, air drone in another part of France and <clears throat> never got very closely associated with them but on, on some missions they were part of the of the uh, plan of attack. You were just telling us about being shot down in combat um, making a crash landing the whole crew survived um, was that the most memorable experience of your entire career, or was there something else you could tell us about? Well, that, that's the, the experience that stands out by itself, and it's one that uh, I'll always remember. This happened so many years ago that time has a way of fading memories. So. The one I've told you about is, is really the one that was the most significant as far as I'm concerned. Was there a most memorable character in your service experience? Well, uh, Al Linz, he was my tail gunner, and I've mentioned him before. He was. The real, excitable one. Real excitable <laughs> guy. A real excitable guy. And um, the time that uh, he got excited on seeing the enemy aircraft approaching and was going to tell us all about it, he forgot about alternating his right and left thumb. So. <laughs> <laughs> so you heard a lot of machine gun. 
<laughs> instead of Al. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Was there a humus, humorous experience you could tell us about? I would have to think about that one. John, I don't, I, I don't remember any particular experience that stands out. And uh, as I said before, the, the, the years that have passed have, have dimmed a lot of memories. And I don't recall uh, a lot of things that I recall immediately afterward. Mm -hmm. OK, you guys went to Switzerland. Um, the war in Europe was over. Yes. Uh, when and wh where were you discharged? <clears throat> well, I was discharged in um, 1946. I I came back from uh, from Europe after having served in the Air Transport Command. Uh, when the war ended, I got into the Air Transport Command and was based in Rome. And uh, from there, I was flying cargo and passengers between Rome, Athens, and Cairo, and back again, and sometimes the other way up to uh, Paris. When my tour was finished there, I got in with a crew that was going to ferry a Beach 17 a war-weary B-17 back to the United States. So, and uh, our crew was made up of guys that were in the Air Transport Command and had finished their tours. Uh, we went to Paris where we picked up an airplane and uh, had it outfitted for overwater flight. And then we started on, on the way back. We flew to Casablanca landed there, refueled, went to uh, French West Africa, Dakar, refueled there, then landed on Ascension Island in the Atlantic for refueling. And from there, we went to Belém, Brazil, then up to uh, Barinquin in Puerto Rico, finally uh, West Palm Beach. And I was home. That's a marvelous flight. You had a good navigator. <laughs> yes, we did. Have <laughs> if you it. found Ascension, you had a good navigator. Yeah. When you came home, <clears throat> uh, did you join the reserve, or was that the end of your military career? I did join the reserve, uh, and I was in, in it for, for just a short while. Uh, my, my work and uh, what I was doing kept me pretty busy, and I was not able to keep up with reserve activity. Mm -hmm. Did you join any uh, veterans organizations, the American Legion or something like that? Yes, I, I was a member of the American Legion when I first uh, got out, but I haven't kept up with them. Mm -hmm. When you came home, what were your feelings about coming home? You had, you had had a great adventure, and now you're a civilian again. What, did, how, what would you feel about this? Well, I was, I was glad that it was over and uh, that I could uh, go back to doing other things. Uh, I was looking forward to uh, getting an education, finding a job, getting married, having kids, all those things that uh, most people do. Heading toward all those grandchildren. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Can you tell us about um, the feelings of your family and community when you came home? What was post-war America like? I, I, I found they were very uh, receptive and, and very uh, welcoming. It, it felt good to come home. Everyone was good to you. 
I'm going to skip down just a little bit. Um, can you tell us, was there a, in your view, a difference between the way you were received and the way veterans from other uh, wars were received, Korea or Vietnam? Well, uh, Korea, uh, not Korea so much, but Vietnam, um, the big difference there was that it was an unpopular war and people were tired of it. In World War II, people were united against an enemy, which was Germany. And uh, their support at that time was great. Unfortunately, uh, in the Vietnam area, it being an unpopular war, and uh, people being tired of the war and hearing about the war, their reaction to veterans coming back was different, and that was very unfortunate. I feel, feel real bad for those veterans because they were not treated the way we were. How important to you was serving in the military, Carl? <clears throat> well, to, <clears throat> to me it was important because I, 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 I did feel that I wanted to fight for my country. This was something that we all felt when we decided to go into the, into the service. And uh, I'm glad I was there to serve my country. Having done so, uh, how do you feel it affected the rest of your life? Well, the experiences that I had in, in, uh, in the service taught me a, a lot of things about life and uh, getting along with other people, appreciating other people's feelings, and cooperating and getting along so that uh, your efforts <clears throat> would help others with their tasks. We're getting close to the end here, Carl. Is there um, one last thought or memory or something you would like to share with your family or people who might be looking at this tape 50 years from now that we just haven't covered here today? Well, the only thought I would like to leave is this, is that uh, for all young people facing a future and facing life, they should first of all be true to themselves and follow their dreams. Carl, thank you. We appreciate your coming here today. You've you contributed a great deal to this program, and we, we're very grateful to you. Thank you. It was my pleasure. <laughs>